Welcome, my name is Kelly Anderson and this is Fanimated, the animation fan podcast where we get a chance to geek out about our favorite animated media. Today I'm joined by Nathan Knobloch to discuss one of the most popular shonen battle anime of our time, My Hero Academia. If you are an anime fan at all, this superhero show produced by Studio Bones needs little introduction, but if you're here to see what all the hype is about, we're glad to have you. Just a note that we will be discussing the characters and events of the first four seasons, so spoiler warning for those who haven't seen the show. Also note that we recorded this episode without any prior knowledge of the manga and before season four had completed its final episodes. Now, we have lots and lots of exciting superheroes, battles, and drama to discuss, so let's get started and let's get animated. Nathan, it's super awesome to have you back on the podcast. I'm glad to be back. It's me again. And you know what that means? We're talking about superheroes. Superheroes. That is right. You're our um, residential fanimated superhero expert now. <laughs> I'm glad to be. <laughs> Good. Last time you were on, we talked about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, um, which was an awesome episode. Be sure to check that out and listen to that if you have not yet. Um, and today we're diving into more superhero fun times with My Hero Academia. <laughs> yeah, sort of across the world. You know, we have the Marvel Cinematic Universe as our sort of Western superheroes. And now we have a little bit of an anime, action anime superhero story. Exactly. So great. So first off, what is your backstory in regards to anime? Like how much anime have you watched? Um, where does this fit in to your consumption of anime? Because obviously you you uh, consume a lot of like superhero Marvel media, but what about anime in particular? Anime supplements a lot of it. Um, I watch a lot of the Netflix original series animes, uh, whatever sort of series are on there. I have a group of nerdy friends that always were watching anime. So uh, I don't have like a whole lot of like the old school, like Toonami anime that was like Dragon Ball Z and Naruto. But I've watched, you know, your share of uh, fairy tale episodes and uh, Full Metal Alchemist and Hunter Hunter. I think I've mentioned that in our fanimated group chat. No one had watched it. That's a very good action anime on uh, Netflix if everyone else wants to watch something. Yeah, I definitely need to check that one out because people talk about it all the time. And I, I love Shonen Battle anime. So why am I not watching that? I don't know. <laughs> Do it. It's great. <laughs> so My Hero Academia is our current topic of conversation. I'm so excited that we're finally talking about it. It's been definitely on the top of my list for a long time. And so I'm super excited to get your thoughts on it um, as someone who, you know, consumes a lot of different superhero media and like how this take, I guess, on superheroes is different and, um, you know, kind of where the story is going compared to other superhero stories. Because I think it's a lot different than like the marvel cinematic universe for example right so a lot of like the superheroes in the mcu are like established because they were created in like the 60s and so uh -huh. there's not this whole like new superhero idea or like the just getting started sort of deal and my hero academia is essentially about like high school kids like it's a school slash superhero anime type deal like it's just kids starting out and so there's this whole like coming of age idea there's this whole like what does it mean to be a hero idea there's this all of this like looking to their existing heroes but then also trying to become their own ideas which is you don't you don't get that in a big blockbuster mcu uh mm -hmm. for better or worse like it's very different in that uh sense of the word absolutely and with like uh at the time of recording this, uh, we're just wrapping up. They're wrapping up the fourth season. And so we've got four seasons of anime and we've got two animated movies. We've got three video games. We got stage adaptations. We got a live action movie coming eventually. Like there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of different ways that they are giving us lots of My Hero Academia story, and there's a lot of story to unpack. Um, we're, so we're going to do our best to kind of go through at least the major points and um, the parts that have impacted us the most. Um, and we probably will probably go up through, I don't know, what would you say, like the um, overhaul villain arc um, probably won't get into too much of the later half of season four. Right. So before we get ahead of ourselves, though, maybe we should explain exactly what the <laughs> plot and synopsis of My Hero Academia is. Yeah, good call. So for those of you who don't know, um, My Hero Academia takes place in a world um, just similar to our own, except that out of nowhere, um, people are start uh, uh, started to be born with these random superhuman abilities called quirks. So their superpowers are called quirks. And um, at the time that our main protagonist is in the world, um, it's up to like 80% of the population has these quirks and they range so widely. And it's really fun to see so many different abilities and so many people, um, yeah, that utilize their powers in different ways. But uh, Deku, Izuku Midoriya is his name. Deku is his uh, superhero name and his kind of nickname. I'm just going to call him Deku. Um, he is a, he starts out as just this nerdy middle schooler who has always wanted to be a superhero. And the pro big problem about that is he doesn't have a quirk. So he is one of the few in their society that doesn't have a super ability. And in this superhero society, uh, they made superheroes like an actual job. So it's like run by the government in Japan and like they get paid and they like have agencies and all these things um, to kind of supplement what the police can't do. Um, so they're, you know, they're taking this Western individualistic superhero model, but putting it into a very Japanese community centric uh, society. And so Deku, his like origin story is basically that he runs into um, a villain situation to save his friend just without thinking. He's just running in, trying to save him. And it inspires um, All Might, the number one, vil uh, number, number one hero and Deku's like role model um, to also step in. And so... All Might comes to Deku and is like, um, you too can be a hero. I'm going to give you my superpower that was handed down to me and I'm going to hand it down to you so you can also be a great hero. And that's kind of where it all starts. Yeah. And just to be clear, the whole like handing down a superpower thing isn't is unheard of. Like that's the only person in the entire world and it's a very small group of people that actually know that the number one hero, All Might's power, can be passed down. Because it'd be very dangerous to, like, try and, like, capture him and force him to, like, give his power to the wrong people or, like, use it for bad. Um, mm -hmm. And so after Deku gets his power, though, there's he essentially goes to a school, a very, like, Xavier's school for the mutants like it's a very uh -huh. x-men type of idea um and so at that point he their whole action anime troop of you know characters shows up and there's 20 classmates and a bunch of teachers and we're just going to be throwing japanese names around and superheroes <laughs> and superhero names around and it's going to probably get very confusing but we'll do our best to you know describe who these characters are in their heroes and what they bring to the show absolutely one of the benefits of this show one of the really cool things is just how large of a cast it has and how varied um all the different characters are and because there are so many of them some of them are just kind of stereotypes but it's amazing how how deep we get to go with so many of them and uh see so much character development across so many different um, characters and students, but truly it is a huge cast to, uh, 
get to watch and watch grow. And, and they're all there. They're all at this school. They're all at UA um, to become pro heroes. That's everyone's goal. And they all have different reasons for that. And they all have different um, beliefs and values. And they all, uh, you know, the big overarching, like, plot of the show is just like exploring this superhero society and like what does it mean to be a hero and everyone has a different answer to that question and sometimes they clash and and so that's kind of where um a lot of the story comes in and like where they go with building these characters right and so that all sounds great and super descriptive uh, but I had a really tough time getting into this anime, <laughs> Kelly, because oh, really? no one was able to really explain this whole like grand idea to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you watch the first couple episodes, it's Deku is super annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I you definitely need to continue watching to get to the meat of this show. But season one is incredibly. Mm, boring to me (laughs) like you're like oh they have so many characters and so many different things going on but like none of that happens until season two and so you have to like watch 12 episodes and I'm just like oh come on and I I what my nerdy group of friends told me to watch it I didn't like it you told me to watch it I didn't like it (laughs) Bryn on our group chat essentially a stranger to me offered to marathon through the entire thing with me. And I was like, all right, okay, everyone needs to calm down about this show. I'll get through it. Uh. And so I guess one of like the biggest hurdles to me though, was at the very, like essentially season one though, is not really anything like new. Like I've already seen this like story before. Um, And in an ongoing effort to convince everyone that Harry Potter is also an action anime, uh, essentially season one and the plot of the Sorcerer's Stone is exactly the same. (laughs) I love that take. (laughs) And I can't wait to uh, hear how you're going to defend this. And I, I I personally did not think about that at all when I watched My Hero Academia, maybe because I just watched, too much anime but I wasn't connecting it to Harry Potter and now that you say that I'm like oh my goodness they're the same okay so for the first season then what are some of the main points that make you think about Harry Potter all right welcome to my TED talk where Harry Potter is an action anime so (laughs) most action animes are defined by having a single like chosen one character a Deku or a Harry Potter that essentially comes from either a very like nothing background and is suddenly thrust into power or like gains power so the whole like you are a hero Deku part is essentially the same for a Deku and Harry Potter and so those are the same characters Uh, technically in this one All Might is technically Hagrid, I guess, but continue with me. So (laughs) he is thrust into great power. He goes to a school for people that share his power that he's still sort of an outcast for. He meets two side characters, one that is a diligent diligent student, a Uh Hermione Granger character, (laughs) and then a sort of character relief best friend love interest, which is, yep, Ron is... (laughs) Um, Raka. Ochaku? Stick with me. Um, Ochaku. Stick with me. Okay? Okay, I love this. There's a bully. Keep going. <laughs> There's a bully in it that has <laughs> either mass amounts of power and is really mean to our main character. <laughs> Bakugo is Draco. Yes! And then there's definitely... Um, a crazy headmaster, Nizu, uh, is Gandalf. And um, who else am I missing? Oh, a razor head, Sensei um, Aizawa, is Snape. Yeah. It's Snape. Oh my God. I rest my case. <laughs> Mr. Aizawa is definitely Snape. Like, they both look similar. And they're, but they're both like super smart and actually have everyone's best interest at heart, even though they are mean sometimes and like push people around and everyone's scared of them. Oh, 
Wow, that yeah, is brilliant. hundred percent. And then the plot line is like roughly the same of like, they go to school, they essentially do nothing for like most of the middle part where he's just like learning how the world works. And then they yeah. have to defeat a bad guy with no, with, uh, no nose at the end. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Oh, man. Because at the end of season one of My Hero, they, they're they going to do this training at this big facility. And side note, UA has way too much money. <laughs> they build <laughs> all of these super elaborate, like giant, like places for these kids to like basically destroy so that they're like learning how to use their quirk in different environments. And it's like, what, how, why, like stop. (laughs) Anyway, um, (laughs) they go to this facility to like learn how to rescue people or whatever. And they get trapped in there and the, uh, okay. My Hero Academia lays it out straight. There's literally a league of villains, black and white league of villains, (laughs) superheroes, pretty basic but yeah the league of villains traps them in there and attacks and so the kids kind of are on their own for a little while before help arrives to like you know stay alive and combat these villains um so yeah and then of course i I don't know you said dumbledore is kind of like the headmaster i get that but also would Dumbledore then in this situation also kind of be all might because Dumbledore and Harry like have that relationship of like, you know, lessons and I'm trying to teach you and prepare you for the ultimate villain. Right. Um, yes. So they 100%. Have yeah. He's, he's both the uh, wise old man and the gatekeeper in this hero <laughs> arc. But, you know, yes, you can play multiple roles. But that does make me think, wow, they are similar because in both of them too, there is a very specific person that like the hero is destined to face. Yeah, that's true. And like, uh, it's essentially the villain is Shiragaki. Shiragaki? Uh, How do we say these Japanese names? Yeah, (laughs) Shiragaki, who has like hands that cover all of his face and like is very like sinister but he's also like doesn't do much he doesn't. like he's just sort of in the background like all of the yeah. other villains are like really up in everyone's face and like doing things and he's just kind of like sinister vibes right. in the background and also to push this one step forward uh the goblet of fire is just a tournament arc so there you go <laughs> Harry Potter is anime. It has a tournament arc and everything. What? Oh my gosh. Stop. You're blowing my mind. (laughs) So, oh my goodness. Yeah. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. (laughs) Thank you. That was brilliant. Uh, Tomura Shigaraki is definitely a creepy villain, but he's also kind of like... So... He, yeah, can decay things with his hands. Um, But he also has like a, you know, mentor on his side. And that's All for One. And All for One is like the big villain who's been around forever and um, is basically the sworn enemy of whoever holds the power that Deku has. um, And All Might is given to him. The power, by the way, is called One for All. And then, of course, All for One is the villain who (laughs) um, has kind of... It's so on the nose. It just bothers me. (laughs) Oh, it's so great. Um, And so he's kind of been grooming Shigaraki to become this great villain um, in his stead, kind of. Um, And so that's kind of like... And the big overarching, you know, conflict... And, but what they do, what My Hero Academia does and kind of needs to do to like give it breathing space is um, there'll be like a really heavy arc with the League of Villains and with, the you know, Deku and his power and all this stuff. And then there'll be an arc right after that about decorating their dorm rooms, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you go through like most action animes either they're in some sort of like villain arc where there's a bad guy at the end or they're in some sort of like 
training slash tournament arc slash decorating their bedrooms <laughs> arc. And like it just flips back and forth between the two. And so I have the whole like seasons mapped out and essentially every single season follows the same tournament arc, villain arc, tournament arc, villain arc, back and forth, back and forth. Um, mm-hmm. So it's not even like there's seasons to this show necessarily. Uh, there's just arcs going on. So we should definitely go into, um, obviously we've talked about a few of the characters, um, but of this very large cast, um, who are some of your favorite characters um, and why? So I love all of the strange little side characters that get brought up that aren't really the main focus, but sort of surround the story. Um, One that maybe isn't technically a side character, but is by far away my favorite is Todoroki. Shoto yes. Todoroki is single best character in my brain. He's had the most character development. He has the coolest quirks. Like they're amazing. Yes. I mean, he's, he's so OP. Single. He is very very powerful and that's amazing. But like he starts in such a different place than all of the other characters and ends in such a different place after like season 2. Yes. And so it's it's just great to watch that. And so we're like, I technically think Deku has had zero character development in four seasons, which is annoying. But Todoroki <laughs> is like a completely different person. Yes, he is. I also absolutely adore Todoroki. Um, I love his story. I mean, again, if you've listened to this podcast at all, you know that I like father-son relationships. And this one's like Yeah, so I was going to bring that up. <laughs> sorry stole your thunder um yeah if, if you want to go for it go ahead but uh Todoroki's father is the number two hero and so you know he's got a lot of uh things going on in that family yeah so sort of the history of Todoroki is that his father has what what his is named Endeavor his quirk is hellfire so he's essentially like engulfed in flames all the time and can control fire and so he's very very powerful but he saw being a hero as only the power he possessed and was never able to be more powerful than all might and so he could never really achieve being the number one hero and that really hurt him and so apparently in a little bit of the history, there would be sort of arranged marriages between very powerful people to try and uh, essentially have very powerful children. And so Todoroki is this sort of child of an arrangement between uh, a between Endeavor and then uh, Todoroki's mother who had essentially like ice powers. And they had mm-hmm. a bunch of kids until they had Todoroki who was perfectly one half fire, one half freeze and so he can control both fire and ice which is amazing and super awesome but (laughs) he was essentially like this chosen child by uh endeavor and then put through the most like grueling training regimen as a child like his relationship with his father was incredibly destroyed by it he absolutely despises endeavor for what he put him through and Essentially, when he joins UA, he's sworn a bit of an oath to never use his firepower because of mm-hmm. how much both himself and his mother were um, hurt by it. Yes. And his whole family, really. I mean, it's just how awful would it be to, like, his father calls him, what does he call him? Like, his masterpiece. Yeah. Like, it's not even a person. Yeah, you just are, your father just views you as this, like, trophy and this thing. And, like, <clears throat> yeah, Todoroki absolutely despises that. And, like, I can only imagine his siblings. I think he has three siblings, two brothers mm-hmm. and a sister, which don't really show up in the anime that much, at least of, as of yet. Yeah, and then his relationship with his mom is rough, too, because, you know, she's obviously in this, like, arranged marriage, basically, and has a lot of animosity towards Endeavor as well. And it's just a very complex family life. Uh, (laughs) Even though, yeah, his powers are super cool. Also, they all look like koi fish, all the kids. (laughs) I guess, sort of. I mean, they have the colors. It's like 
orange and white. I don't know. That's what it comes to mind when I think, when I look at them. Sure. I'm just used to the whole like Super Saiyan anime hair that they have. <laughs> <laughs> right. I suppose. Um, uh, Todoroki yeah. also. He also off- has like very. Oh, sorry. He has very strong Zuku vibes. I was about to say that. <laughs> Zuko vibes. Um, oh, we're just talking over each other and are, just saying everything. We're in sync. We are remote if people can't tell. <laughs> so we're, there's yeah. a little bit of a communication issue going on. Um, but <laughs> yeah, he's got a big like scar on the, what is it? The fire side of his face mm-hmm. uh, from his mother actually throwing boiling water at him, right? Yeah. Like she couldn't like even bear to look at him as a child. And so he has this estranged relationship with also, also his mother. And so essentially he is incredibly powerful. He's like single-handedly one of the most powerful characters like in the entire show, but he's like so broken. He can't like really figure out how to be a hero. And then right. that's essentially where Deku comes in in the tournament arc in season two, where the show actually gets really, really good. Right. Uh, and before we get into fights and things, and we'll talk about some more characters, but to uh, finish off my my thoughts on Todoroki, like I'm also very grateful that, you know, in a lot of anime, a lot of stories in general, like they kind of push the moms to the side and um, this show doesn't do that. And I love it because even with Todoroki, like he, works to reconnect with his mother and like mend that relationship and it's not like just she's gone forever and like you don't see her um and also with Deku's mom who's the best mom in anime (laughs) she She is very good she's so I wish they would do more with the moms I know uh, it's just like like you you said that usually they push the moms away and like I feel like they are pushing Todoroki's mom away like I want more of just Todoroki in general but more of his relationship with his mom would be just wonderful like there's very like few clips of like him going to go visit her a couple times but they don't ever like show them having like a conversation or like talking about his hero work or anything normal it's mm. just like oh he went to go visit his mom and so then all the other characters go did something did something else. I'm like, but I wanted to know what they were doing. <laughs> right. We're following Deku and Bakugo more than Todoroki at this point. And yeah, I agree. Like, give us more Todoroki story, please. All right, Kelly. Are there other heroes than Todoroki that you like? <laughs> Well, I actually really adore Bakugo, and I'm adoring him more and more. <laughs> and you can't, you, you can. I'm rolling my eyes and sighing. <laughs> okay, well, here's my defense. Um, yes, Bakugo is a bully. He's a jerk. He literally is telling people to kill themselves at the beginning. Okay, and I do not excuse that behavior at all. But um, he's just a really good character because. This whole time, yeah, you think he's the Draco, (laughs) you know, of the story. (laughs) He is. He is the Draco. (laughs) But he's more than that. Um, Because, like, he and Deku, and this is a very anime thing. Like, you see this in a lot of anime um, where they have, like, a rival, you know? There's the hero, and he has this person who, you know, maybe isn't a, a complete antagonist, but is someone who is, like, pushing them to become better. And that is what Deku Mm -hmm. and Bakugo are because they grew up together um, and, you know, their whole lives, Deku didn't have this power and really looked up to Bakugo and knew how powerful he was. Um, But not just for that, you know, they were friends. And then Bakugo kind of turned into a bully and pushed him aside and is like, you know, I'm stronger than you, you know, you don't have a quirk. And I really love like, you know, Bakugo has to reconcile the fact that Deku suddenly does have this power and isn't the, you know, the weakless wimp that he thought he was. And like they both, both of these characters idolize, absolutely adore All Might. Like that's the hero that they want to be like. Um, But they see that in different ways. Like Bakugo wants to beat All Might and wants to like become better than him. And Deku, at least at the beginning, definitely just wants to like 
rise up to like almost level and still like puts all my on a pedestal. Um, but they have so much shared like drive and, um, they have a shared goal. They both want to be the number one hero. Um, and so they push each other to do better. And it's just that Bakugo, it has definitely has some anger <laughs> issues. Um, and he kind of lets that out in, uh, crazy ways sometimes but usually he's like he he actually is he's not just this big mean bully he like he's actually really really smart and intelligent and has like strategy it's just that he does it in his own way um his power by the way is like he has like his sweat is like uh i forget it was like something that explodes so basically it's, he ex it's napalm and so he can he can like essentially shoot out explosive bombs essentially like his literal name is bakugo which is like powerful bomb and <laughs> his first name is katsuki so it's to win like i wrote that down in my notes like his literal name is to win by powerful bombs like yes. he's a very cut and dry like this is the character and i want i want to go back to how they both uh relate to all might and so like mm -hmm. Deku sees All Might as the number one hero because he saves the most people. And so Deku wants to be someone who saves people. And Bakugo sees All Might as the number one hero because he's the most powerful. And he always and so wins. Bakugo see and he always wins. And so Bakugo sees heroes as someone who is the most powerful and always wins. Yes. While Deku sees heroes as someone who saves people. And I feel like Bakugo and Endeavor are really similar characters in that they only saw All Might as how powerful he was. And yeah. like that's one of the like the really you saw this in some of the like more kind of recent episodes, but you can see Bakugo looking at Endeavor and like not liking who Endeavor has become and seeing Endeavor in himself, or at least I'm relating the two characters a lot. Yeah. And seeing like, oh, that's not exactly what I want. So Bakugo is sort of redeeming himself in a couple ways. But he's still so angry and bitter and annoying. <laughs> uh, I've, I guess I've, you say it's it annoying. I've come to find it endearing to a point. <laughs> oh, I'm still so, I'm, an, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed by it. All the yelling and the yeah. mean names. <laughs> Yeah, and like to go further into his redemption, like he he's definitely not fully there yet. Like he and I don't think he's ever going to be what like he's not never going to be what Deku is. He's never going to be that same type of hero. But he definitely is accepting of, you know, he, you know, recently finds out that Deku does have All Might's power and he's kind of taken into the uh what all of that means and what's going on with uh, their relationship and Deku is you know is kind of oh man there's just so much that happens like I should backtrack a little bit but Bakugo gets captured by the League of Villains and because the League of Villains thinks they can turn him to their side and it's such a genius move um, like from a writing standpoint that you have this guy who everyone like hates and suddenly they're like oh yeah he's gonna become a villain obviously and he doesn't. He's very firm in that he know he's going to be a hero. And so he doesn't, um, you know, do what the League of Villains wants and um, makes it very clear that, you know, he's going to be a hero no matter what. And, but in the fight to rescue Bakugo, that is when All Might loses his final, his last, you know, flicker of power. And Bakugo suddenly feels uh, very responsible for the loss of All Might, the number one hero to the world. And, you know, he feels like it's not, it, he feels like it's his fault and that he wasn't strong enough to like save himself. But then Deku feels the same way. Deku feels like it's his fault because Deku was the one there to try to stop the League of Villains from capturing him in the first place. And um, they, so they just have a lot of similar, their stories are very, very uh, in. Inter... intertwined yes they're very intertwined and um when they then after that fight and all might lose it well he he wins but he loses his power um deku goes to fight um 
Well, Bakugo is like, come out and meet me. And Bakugo basically initiates this dumb fight because that's the only way Bakugo can get his feelings out. <laughs> right. And I was just like, that whole time I was like, oh, don't make me feel bad about Bakugo. I want to hate him. And now I can't. <laughs> Nathan, you won't be able to hate him forever. <laughs> oh, so annoying. <laughs> But for real, like both of these characters are sitting there thinking that they're the reason that All Might has lost his power. And they're both having sort of like crisis of self where like Deku is really doubting whether he was like the right choice. And Bakugo is really doubting if he can like actually come out of this and like be a hero if he is responsible for um, the loss of the number one hero for the symbol of peace. Like, Mm -hmm. and so they both blame each other and then they fight it out. And then I I really liked it. That whole like fight scene until the very end where Bakugo like fully understood like what was going on and then got mad at Deku again for like, <laughs> you have the best quirk in the entire world and you can't beat me. Like, <laughs> you didn't- how dare <laughs> you? And I was like, what? No, come on. You made it so far. <laughs> no, but I think that's great. I like my, my perspective is like, um, it's I think it's great that he's like he has gone far and he's he's not like um he's basically giving Deku more to work on he's basically saying like you have to be able to beat me so so that you can become you know the next All Might and but he just he he isn't since you know he's very aggressive about it you know but I think it's great it's like now their relationship is of true rivals of like we're going to push each other to become better and better because the other one has to be better. Like Bakugo is in this place of like, you have to be able to beat me, but good luck because I'm going to be so great. It's not in a, in a selfish way. It's in a, like, you need to become a great hero because you have the power of all might. Um, You need to be able to beat me. You know what I mean? Yeah, a little bit. I feel like Bakugo is still just so focused on like winning and being powerful, though, and it's it's leading him down that sort of endeavor path. And I want him to like identify that and change a little bit. <laughs> well, I don't think his personality will ever become less explosive, uh, pun intended. But <laughs> <laughs> but I am excited to see where they go with Bakugo and. I should state I have not read the manga. I know there's more about Bakugo in the manga that I have not read. Um, but I'm looking forward to it coming to the anime. And I have a lot of hope that, Nathan, you will change your mind and eventually love Bakugo as much as I do. Oh, all right, Kelly. All right. <laughs> Great. Any other characters we want to touch? I mean, we just spent a lot of time talking about the two main ones in Class 1A. Um, that is uh, Bakugo and Todoroki. Yeah. Do you have like a non-student favorite character? <laughs> a non-student favorite character. Or or should we talk about like favorite villains? Oh, yeah. Oh, is man. It, is it time? Is it is time, it time to, talk to talk about, about villains? Uh, Hero Killer Stain? Yes, it's time to talk about Hero Killer Stain. It's, it's uh, the best villain in my opinion, by far, end of story. Yeah, down. There's no one even comes in comparison. Like, he is so great, and he's only around for, like, four or five episodes. Uh, but they're amazing. Yes. Um, even better than, like, the big bad one for... Uh, what? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to be mixing these up so much. Exactly. <laughs> all, um, for all for one. <laughs> yeah. All for one is the villain, one for all. Their names are so confusing. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, um, Hero Killer Stain is the best. Nathan, explain to everyone why he's the best. He is the best uh, because if you're familiar with the nine D&D alignments, Hero Killer Stain is lawful evil. Yes. He has this set, like, mandate of himself that he is going to rid the world of all of the fake heroes, all of them that are doing hero work for fame or glory or are not up to his standard of what a hero is. He shows up and kills them. That's why he got his name, Hero Killer Stain. Like 
his like essential like driving factor like to his very capture and is that he is going to follow these rules to make the world pure and better and has this idea that he's doing the right thing while also fully aware that it's the wrong thing it's very complex but like essentially where he comes into the story is that he's he's doing his his dirty work and ends up greatly injuring um one of the students older brothers so Ida who has become Deku's best friend and uh has a, a whole family of heroes his older brother Ingenium is injured by Hero Killer Stain and so while they are doing this sort of internship program Ida has this vendetta to go like essentially hunt down the Hero Killer Stain and successfully finds him and hero kill stain goes look look at what you're doing this is not hero work this is a vendetta you have and thus like deems ida as not like worthy to be a hero but then deku and todoroki show up to save ida and stain goes that's hero work i'm not gonna hurt you two i'm only here for him because he isn't like pure of heart essentially and it's it's so convoluted, but it's also like one of the only instances I've seen of like this very strict lawful evil archetype being followed in any media, really. So he's incredibly unique. Mm-hmm. And that that narrative of just building Ida, Ida was like the Hermione Granger. He was like always the student, like this one that was always studying and like being very studious about everything and always following all the rules and he sort of like breaks down from his brother getting hurt and then has to realize through this villain again that sort of what he was doing was wrong yeah and that's what's so great and i think is a great segue into our favorite villain just our favorite fights in general is that all the fights in My Hero Academia are not just like fun to watch, you know, as most shonen battle anime have a ton of awesome fun fight scenes to watch. My Hero Academia always like gives it a reason, like a reason for the story, a reason for the characters, uh, for them to be fighting. And like it, it, it changes people and the fights like make an impact, a lasting impact on the story. And this one, especially- against hero killer stain is absolutely phenomenal yeah i i guess i kind of already mentioned the synopsis of the fight but right (laughs) uh it's it's also like very scary too because like stain's quirk is called blood curdle like what a great villain quirk but he essentially can taste a bit of someone's blood and paralyze them for a short period of time and so that's how he had been able to like overpower all of these very very powerful heroes is that if he cuts them once, he's he's also just like covered in knives. So if he cuts them once, they're they're essentially immobile and can't do anything against him. And so this this fight is just essentially these children trying to overwhelm him while Stain is trying to stick to his oath of like not hurting the specific heroes he deems worthy. Stain right. also has another obsession with All Might because he sees All Might as the perfect hero. And so he's like, only All Might will be allowed to ever defeat me. And so essentially, like, he won't back down from any fight that isn't like against All Might, mm-hmm. which is crazy for all of like essentially everyone in the society to be obsessed with All Might. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every, I mean, truly, this show revolves around all night it's all about all night because he's the symbol of peace he is the symbol of you know heroism and everyone has an opinion about him everyone has a, or a vendetta against him like everyone uh yeah. he is the symbol of this hero society and everyone has their own beef with <laughs> with this society and with how the world works because of everyone with quirks um so yeah it all comes back to all my all the time all right so like uh but jumping off of the all might thing again like all might is what 
it all might is the archetype of a paragon essentially he's like a fully formed hero that represents more than simply a person like he represents the idea of this hero society and paragons are essentially like both unchanging but also like uh never like moving like all might's ideas and existence will permeate throughout the entire story and deku is also a type of paragon in that he continually pushes all of the other classmates to follow his lead and follow his example of what a hero is mm. but also like makes both of those characters essentially unchanging which is mm. it's great for storytelling but it's not great for character development <laughs> right like you said yeah we spent all this time talking about these characters we haven't even really talked about the main character much because there isn't a lot to say yeah like essentially these two characters of all might and deku like exist to be examples for everyone else and everyone else will be changed by their by deku and all might's actions and story and like that's the role of a paragon whether you like like it or not like some people really love paragon some people really love superman and this idea of like a pure good and some people are like well you know superman's really boring he just punches everything in the face until it's you know no longer an issue which is like essentially what all might does but like one of the most interesting things about all might to me though is the like what i've deemed small might like when he's not (laughs) super powerful he ends up having this like very small character like model and very like tiny a uh, man of like very small stature yeah. like when he's in this like powerful mode he's just like all muscle and just the you know wwe wrestler style of i'm a punch it like he's just like all gung-ho on everything and then he releases his power and he's just like a tiny dude and like to see a paragon character essentially have this alter like weak ego of like oh you all see this like idea of it but it's not true was mm-hmm. super super interesting to me and then they never really did anything with it <laughs> i know well what do you think now like now that um all my doesn't ha- you know can't really be in that you know superhero form much and kind of just has to be his weak self without his powers um do you feel like that has changed uh, your opinion or view do you think they I still don't... have room to play with that or not they do have room to play with it i'm just i don't think they are doing anything with it like like even when he's still teaching deku like he goes into his superpower form for like just you know his you must be the symbol of peace you know you must be ready to say i am here like that's all like (laughs) he comes in to say and just like he it's it's he's not taking on like a new character as small might he's essentially still ignoring his weakness and i don't think he'll ever really acknowledge his own weakness Hmm. do you think um and this is going forward in the anime but um night eye had a vision that you know all might was gonna die from a villain fight um, and obviously we've kind of, they've kind of elaborated that uh, Deku has, this, you know, his strong will is able to change uh, Night Eye's future vision, but. Um, well, it's not Deku, it's well, Eerie, but. Oh, 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 snap. Did you not catch that? <laughs> uh, she can rewind time. So then the time that Night Eye saw is no longer the real timeline. Yeah, but I thought it was also because Deku had, like, such a specific, like, forward momentum and, like, determination that he, because Eri, like, changes, rewinds, like, people. It's weird to explain. Um, But she's not, like, rewinding time. I'm pretty sure they say like she rewinds time for that for person. That person, right, right, right. Yeah, 
I guess they when go I, back in time. I guess when I watched it, it was about Deku. And maybe I need to go back and rewatch some of season four because in preparation for this episode, I rewatched re all of all of everything up through season three. And then I stopped because I was like, oh, well, I just watched season four. But I also um, have only seen season four once and mostly all in subtitled Japanese because I don't like to wait for the English dub to come out. <laughs> I also watched season four with subtitles when I had watched all the other seasons with dub. And it's a very different show with subtitles. And it, I don't know if I like it as much. <laughs> you like the English dub better. <laughs> yeah, like I I like the All Might voice, the oh, I am here, like the whole like very powerful. And I think some of the characters, especially the female characters, like feel very like cutesy in mm -hmm the original Japanese and yeah. while I it's probably just a like a cultural thing they sound you know like normal high school girls in the other ones right. and it it makes their characters to me sound like sillier when I want their characters to be like important and vital to the story when they're not always <laughs> and that's also disappointing that brings up a, a really great point. The female characters are so varied and so fun and so interesting, but this manga, this show does not utilize them to their full abilities at all in the story. It sucks. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, essentially, Araka, like, started out, like, yes, she is sort of the love interest, but she started out, like, with her own character, like, motives and ideas, and in the sports festival tournament arc that we'll talk about, like she was incredibly powerful and was like, I'm going to be a hero to like help my parents. And then they didn't do anything with that. Like there's nothing wrong with her parents. Like they're, they are never mentioned again. And like, she sees like this fight and she's like, Oh my gosh, I have to get so much stronger. I'm going to like join the strange internship to become like a fighter. And then like never really show her, like they show her like every once in a while, like, Oh, look at this fighting move I learned. But like, uh -huh. They've essentially overwritten any of her character development with, oh, she's like obsessed with Deku and it's ruining her character. Yes, um, she she is. She's so she is like clever and has a really, really fun power. She can touch things and like basically turn them. Uh, they they won't react to gravity. So she gets to kind of bounce around and um do that and it's really cool and she is she's just a strong character but all of the female characters are overshadowed by the, their ma male counterparts like even within class 1a you have Deku and Bakugo and Todoroki I say are their big main like focuses and it's like can't we like focus on like a girl character even um Yaoyorozu is one of my favorite characters in class. Yes, she is easily the one of my favorite of the female heroes. And I love her story arc with Todoroki as well throughout that season two from both the like internships and sports festival to the finals mm -hmm. uh, is so great. And their relationship, I th feel like was great. Um, and so essentially like, everyone saw how powerful Todoroki was at the sports festival. And so when like the finals or when class finals came around, they essentially had to fight off against their teachers and Todoroki and Yayurosu were paired up and Todoroki like essentially took the lead because he was like, I'm the most powerful. I should be the leader. Mm -hmm. While ya Yayurosu was like essentially top of the class throughout all of like the academics. Like she's incredibly smart. She knows what's going on. She does all of her like research and she's like making perfect marks on everything was just like, Oh yeah, of, of course you're the, the most powerful. I'll just sit this one out. And essentially Todoroki's like plan fails yeah. and like, he doesn't have any sort of like backup plan other than like, Oh, we're going to go like punch a racer head in the face, like very normal hero strategy. <laughs> um, and so then, yeah, you comes in and was like, yo, like we should actually do like this thing and like, you know, like trap him a little bit so that we can actually like escape and not punch him in the face. <laughs> and like, turns out that like, even though Todoroki is more powerful, Yayurosu is a significantly better leader because she yeah. is so, so smart. Yeah, she has, uh, she's a great strategist. And 
her power is essentially she can create things from like her body but only if she understands like the chemical like and like basic compounds and makeup genetic makeup of like what the the inanimate thing that she's creating so she's really really smart because she studies all of these things and like how like things are created so that she can then create those items um and so of course she's just got this like brilliant like mind um and that was such a cool like little segment of that uh season getting to focus on her but again then like in bigger bigger crazier fights you know like even with the one recently with um, Overhaul, you get to really look at like uh, Lemillion, which we'll talk about, and uh, Kirishima, who's Red Riot. Like they give these other male characters in at the school like really uh, significant uh, screen time. And it's really awesome. Like those are great characters. But do we get to look at like Araku when she's, you know, in that battle too? But not, not really. <laughs> No, and like, can you even name the big three character that's female? Nope. <laughs> not, <laughs> exactly. I I can only do it because I have it written down here, and it's it's uh, Nigiri Hado, and her quirk is spiral shockwaves, and she appears like four times. I don't I don't even know. Like, there's essentially an entire episode dedicated to Sun Eater, and an entire episode dedicated to Lemillion, and then the third big of the big three, like. Gets it, nothing. Nothing. Like, she's in a beauty pageant. Like, really? Yeah. Oh, come on. Oh Guy. All God. right. My Hero Academia. Do better. Do better. Uh, okay. So that's our good rant on <laughs> all the females. Our good fentanyl rant for the episode. Yes. Make Emma and Bryn happy. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sure they'll be very happy to hear that. So should we go in, we've already like discussed quite a few of them, but should we go into our favorite fight scenes and just the fight scenes in general? Because that's what a shonen battle anime is all about. It's about the battles. Um, And I should say too, for those who don't know, like um, shonen anime is basically just anime that's targeted towards boys. Um, And shonen battle anime specifically just has, it's like a sub -genre, genre of anime its focus is obviously on like these big fight scenes and there's usually, I mean, think of like, yeah, Dragon Ball and like Naruto, like you said, and um, all those other ones. There's like, there are so many different types even within that subgenre, but that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, and yeah, so it's the sitcom of anime <laughs> <laughs> where essentially it's the same like, Seinfeld show every single time and they all follow the same plot and they're all very familiar and they're all full of tropes and the interesting part between the two is sort of where they break the tropes or what their magic system is or you know but it's all the same and it's all exactly Harry Potter as well so <laughs> I love this I love this comparison Harry Potter is an anime can someone make that can, can someone get the rights so that they can just make a Harry Potter anime specifically shown in battle anime <laughs> Oh my gosh, I can like picture it. It'd be fantastic. So we've talked a lot about the tournament arc, and I think we should go into that because that's where our one of our favorite fights is at, and it's phenomenal. So you're talking about the sports festival tournament arc. Yes. I guess I, I just yes, I classify right. it as the tournament arc because it is like the big <laughs> over like half of season two, it's the tournament arc. Um the Sports festival. Yeah, so if you can get yourself through the sludge that is season one, yeah. you start off with easily one of the best tournament arcs ever created, the tournament arc, the favorite of everyone. All right, so I, I think I know what is your favorite fight in <laughs> that arc. Yes. If you want to, you know, do the honors. It's definitely Deku <laughs> versus Todoroki, um, the best fight in that whole sequence of fights which are all phenomenal but it's Todoroki versus Deku and here's why they are at a clash because we get to learn about Todoroki's history and his family stuff that we've just talked about um and so he has yeah this 
grudge against his father and he refuses to use his fire power. He never uses it. He only uses his ice power in battles. And Deku is looking at that going like, you have to use every power that you have to become the best. Like you, like your power is your own. Your, that power is not your father's. It's yours and it's your life and you can do what you want. Right. But instead of talking about it, like normal humans, they're going to fight about it. <laughs> yes. Cause it's an action anime. And I guess I want to preface this fight with the thing that happened right before the fight, which mm. I think was one of the best moments in the entire show, and it made me cry, is technically Deku and Todoroki f- fight in a higher bracket. Like, it's their second or third fight, and Todoroki's first fight was against uh, Saro, who essentially can, like, shoot tape out of his uh, elbows, and so it's a very weird quirk, but essentially Todoroki, like, Saro, like goes for him and is like trying to trap him with his tape and throw him out of the ring. And Todoroki just like stomps his foot and fills the entire stadium with ice. (laughs) Like your entire state, like Todoroki is by far and away the most powerful hero that anyone has seen. Like there are professional heroes at this thing and their jaws have dropped. Like they do not understand what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. He is, incredibly powerful Deku should be so scared Deku should be just like he there's no way Deku can win this fight there's absolutely like nothing he could do he can't even like control his powers yet and at the very end of that episode it's episode 20 you can just skip right to it it's wonderful um Todoroki uses his fire to essentially unfreeze Saro and Deku ends the entire episode where he just says like Total, I was looking out and I wasn't scared. All I felt was he looked sad to me. Uh, and that just made me weep. Like uh, Todoroki is easily so, so powerful. And he just demolished Sarah in this fight. And he's like on the verge of tears because uh, he just like can't handle being this like powerful. He, and he feels so sorry for everybody. And he's just my... You know, he's just my sad boy, Todoroki. Yes. And so I almost like that fight more, but it leads into uh, the Deku fight so well. It does. It really does. And at this point in the story, Deku, you know, he really has to, and this is what the show does well too, I think, is the kids like have these powers, but not only do their powers grow, but they really have to think about how to use them well. And It's not like a lot of other, at least at this point, it's not like a lot of other shonen battle anime where they suddenly had this hidden power they didn't know about. Um, It's like uh, they, you know, have to really train themselves to use their powers in different ways. And Deku at this point is not accustomed to his power at all. And so whenever he uses it, he breaks his limbs (laughs) Um, because it's so strong. Like badly, like (laughs) badly. It hurts. It's painful to watch. Um, so his like, body is I don't not- understand how he's like still standing. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so obviously like Deku has this great power, but he isn't, he, he can't utilize it to its best advantage against Todoroki, who's absolutely incredible. And Deku basically, it's a clash of their ideals in the respect of Deku wants Todoroki to become better. And he kind of for he Deku gives up his chance at winning in a way just to, you know, he's using this fight as a way to uh, show Todoroki that he has to be able to use his firepower. Like he won't be able to become the best hero that he can be without it. And that again, like it is his power, not his father's. And he, just because he uses it does not mean that he's given in to his father's wishes. Um, and so it's this phenomenal fight scene. And um, I should say too, that my hero academia, it's not about like crazy cor- fight choreography or crazy, crazy visuals, which uh, the visuals are amazing and we'll definitely get to talking about it. Um, and some of them is just like, wow, especially in this fight at the end. But it's less about that and it's more about like where you get so invested and you get so 
um, uh, sucked into these fight scenes because of what is happening internally. Like it is such a good mix of um, bringing those internal struggles to this external fight sequence. Um, and so that's what this is. It's like absolutely fantastic. Deku is like breaking all his fingers <laughs> in, in gruesome ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just to describe like what's actually happening is so like Todoroki is trying to hold back a little bit as well. So he essentially filled the entire stadium with ice for Sarah. So he's doing those giant ice moves and Deku is breaking and sending out giant shock waves with every one of his fingers. And so every time that Todoroki throws huge amounts of ice at uh, Deku, he also Todoroki is also sort of like freezing portion of his body. Like he gets actually very, very cold. And Deku kind of picks up with that. And it wouldn't like hurt Todoroki if he was using both ice and fire to like right. essentially thaw himself out. Yeah. And so Deku is just like breaking all of his fingers and his arms. And he goes for like this final move to like fo- essentially force Todoroki's hand in that like you can't beat me with just your ice anymore you have to do something and Todoroki just winds up and throws both ice and fire at Deku at a, like a Hail Mary effort and creates this giant like he- super heated sonic boom that is even more powerful than any of the ice he'd done before and just f- throws Deku out of the ring like it just like eliminates any chance that Deku has of even staying on his feet or in this like wrestling ring and to win the fight. And he's, you know, he had to use his firepower. He, he yeah. did it. He took it into his own hands. He did. And it's phenomenal. And that little section of animation is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. Um, and then what happens after the fight is even better too, because then Endeavor is ecstatic. He's like, yes, he's finally, you know, you're out of your rebellious stage. You finally used your firepower. And uh, Todoroki is like, no, this hasn't changed anything. Like in my my opinions of you and in my uh, belief that I'm not going to be, become like you. But instead it kind of puts Todoroki down a path of, okay, I am going to use, I'm going to use the tools I have to my advantage and I'm going to use my connection with Endeavor to my advantage and not to his. I love it. Yeah, and Deku's like completely knocked out. <laughs> and and he, uh, what a heal, healer girl is just like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, recovery girl is like, dude, I will not do this for you again. You need to stop breaking everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can we also honorable mention the uh, Araka versus Bakugo fight? Yes, it was so. Because I was, it was so good, and I was like, "Oh, great! The female like like love interest character is gonna have all these cool things that are gonna happen." And this was before they had dashed all of my hopes and dreams. And like, oh. essentially, Bakugo is just like exploding everything, and Araka Uraka is just like dodging everything. And then at the very end, you realize that she had actually been levitating all the shrapnel uh-huh. and was just going to like drop it on him and it was going to be great. And then Bakugo was like, oh, this isn't even my final form and just blows up everything. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh all right. Yeah, but you're rooting for her because at that point, Bakugo is still a jerk mostly. And um, it's so satisfying that like, you know, you're just watching her getting pummeled basically. And Bakugo isn't letting back, uh, holding back because like he knows, he knows that she's, you know, a formidable opponent. And then at the, and then that reveal of, oh, she was causing him to make explosions, to make shrapnel. So she had something to levitate. And I was like, yes, it's so satisfying. Even though she didn't win, it was, it, it did. It, it was a great show of her and I wish they would showcase her more. <laughs> Yeah, like, that's literally, like, one of the only, like, fight showcases we've ever, like, received (laughs) from her. Ah, it's honorable mention, though. Honorable mention. (laughs) And then, of course, our Mm -hmm. other favorite fight, which we've already mentioned as well, is in season two, uh, the best season, and that is the Hero Stain versus Ida and Deku and uh, Todoroki. Um, it's, It's just, again, like the clash of ideals and the clash of like these very unique quirks like coming together it's so it's and this like such high stakes too because uh stain is kind of the first 
it was the first fight that I felt like, oh, these kids are actually in danger. Like the League of Villains in the first season, like that didn't mm-hmm. feel quite as intense to me. Um, but Stain definitely did because you'd already seen him kill all these people. And um, it was like the time limit, you know, they were just like, they were really doing all they could to keep him at bay because they were just like trying to run down the clock until uh, pro heroes could get there. Um and, and just like seeing these uh, students work together um, after ha- after the tournament arc, after seeing how much they've grown and changed and um, then working together uh, was really, really cool. Yeah, it's essentially like the end to the Todoroki f- first fight. Like essentially he identified that he could be his own hero and then he was his own hero and did everything for himself to save his friends. And I feel like that fight, although like very dangerous, brought those three characters together. And you could kind of see that at the end that they, you know, would like kind of eat lunch together and like hang out. And they were like friendly where before essentially Bakugo and Todoroki were like completely isolated loners. And now yeah. Todoroki is like slowly being brought into this like fold of, you know, the normal student life, which is wonderful just to see him ad- adapt. And I'm pretty sure they also like delayed enough time for was it All Might to show up or was it Endeavor to show up? Endeavor. I yeah. feel like it was I think it was Endeavor. And so like even though Todoroki like saved um helped save Ida, like it was still his father that saved him in the end. Uh the when the fi- heroes finally showed up, which I really liked that it wasn't like he had Endeavor had to acknowledge the power and development that his son had grown and that his son was actually able to fend off this, you know, notorious villain for quite a while for him to show up. Um, And that's that's kind of been a theme as well going forward is that like uh, Endeavor having to essentially finally respect his own son. Right. And respect his own son's like... uh visions for the future which are not aligned with you know endeavors and endeavor is going to be it seems to be he's going to be a an even bigger part of the seasons going forward especially now that he is like is he or is he not the number one uh hero so there's a lot going on Mm -hmm. there i also really love after this fight um the heroes pro heroes come and um you know, to, uh, to take care of everything. But then these Nomu come and like attack Deku and like grab him and Stain again, like sticking to his ideals actually saves Deku. But then he gives, Oh my gosh, I completely forgot about that. Gosh, it's insane. It is so crazy. And then he gives this little speech Stain does. And it is the most like nerve wracking. Like you're just like, everyone is so is completely still like everyone is frozen in terror as stain like you know had bounded out of his you know confinements and like he's he took down that nomu to save deku but no one really knows that for sure so he's over there with deku and like it's like terrifying and he's like you know, saying all of his stuff about, you know, hero, how he thinks heroes should be and all of that. And no one can move. Like none of the heroes can do anything. The only thing that actually stops him is that Stain had a broken rib or something and he like collapses. Uh, And it's just, it was, Mm -hmm. that moment was terrifying and really well done visually too. Yeah. I had completely forgotten about that. I should go rewatch that episode. (laughs) Yes, rewatch the whole fight scene. I don't know how many episodes it takes, but it's a good one for sure. All right. Um, any other fights that we want to touch on? I feel like those mm, are my. Five all I can think of is the overhaul fight. Yeah, the overhaul fight is cool. I what I like about that is that it gives so many different students a chance to shine, like we already mentioned, um, because there's so yeah. many different pieces going on. Um, overhaul himself, like I was really hoping he'd be a great villain, but I actually didn't like him very much. I thought he was pretty one note and boring. Yeah, it it's it's hard to compare any villain in the series after we got the you know the amazing 
uh hero killer stain yeah. uh but he has he has his moments um he's very very like chaotic mm-hmm. like you think he's like this well organized mob boss but in reaction in like in reality his like quirk essentially to like break things down and rebuild it is very chaotic and like he doesn't like value people very much because he can he sees everything as just like this matter that he can either destroy and rebuild or yeah. like just something as a like a of a tool like he treats eerie as a tool he treats his henchmen like tools and mm-hmm. it's very monochromatic in that regard yeah i will say what he has going for him is honestly just like is is airy like what makes him scary is like having airy there beside him this this child this young girl who is basically being completely um tortured and abused by him and like his what his ability to kind of even now in the later part of the season like uh cause her anxiety and fear and like trauma um like that's mm-hmm. what's terrifying about him and his his quirk you know is definitely scary and crazy and terrifying but i feel like those aspects like how how i view him like through aries eyes is the is the worst is the the yeah the, the craziest true fear part. the true villainy yeah that's the true villain part all right but let's make a point though he has great aesthetics uh yeah <laughs> all of the bird masks <laughs> For sure. <laughs> His gloves and like, yeah, he's creepy. <laughs> yeah. he Well, he's like, he's he's really scared of like, uh, like sickness too. So all of his uh, like henchmen all have these like plague masks mm-hmm. and he's always complaining about like things getting dirty. And <laughs> it's, it's sort of comical, but it's also like, I love a villain with a theme. <laughs> a theme. <laughs> For sure. And it is, it's like crazy. And he does look cool and terrifying and intimidating. And yeah, definitely. I feel like, I feel like too, when the League of Villains, you know, comes at the end of his arc and like very cartoony, like a uh, car chase to like t- uh, find overhaul and um, they come and like cut off his hands. Like it just felt like, wow, this overhaul, this, scary creepy villain is now just kind of pathetic and the league of villains who i still think as very very cartoony and very like non-threatening in a lot of ways comes and like defeats him it's just like oh goodness yeah the league of villains is you know i always hope that they're like more scary and they definitely were in their villain arc that led up to the like all for one fight mm-hmm. at like the camp, like the camp villain arc. Um, yeah. They were very scary, but there was like a lot of them at that point. And then a lot of them got defeated. And so they're sort of in this sort of remission state where they only have like a couple members and uh, Shigaraki isn't really, you know, showing his hands anywhere and like yeah. just kind of hiding. Um So we'll see. We'll see if they acquire new uh, members and if they're, you know as scary as some of the original ones yeah we'll we'll just have to see because we know for one thing for certain they're not going anywhere all right so so i'll just go um into some of like the production stuff quick um the manga was first published in july of 2014 um it's written by and i'm going to butcher this name i apologize uh kohei horikoshi Uh, who's been writing the manga series and doing a phenomenal job. Um, It's animated by Studio Bones, one of the best uh, studios for sure. Uh, They did Full Metal, Alchemist, and Brotherhood, Noragami, Mob Psycho 100, just to name a few. And all of those have phenomenal fight scenes in them. So obviously the animation in these fight scenes is fantastic and honestly just gets better and better with every season in my opinion so go studio bones love them love love um and at first the show first aired 2016 and 
again, like I said, it's four seasons, um, two movies at this point, um, just a lot, a lot of content there. And I honestly think they do a really good job too of doing the anime only stories like the movies. And so there are actually some episodes that are not in the manga, but they created just for TV. And those are really fun. Like they do a really good job of sticking with the characters. It's the movies. I feel like it just with any anime movie. Well, a lot of them, at least they can't affect the main storyline. So they can't do anything that's going to cause permanent consequences, which is kind of sad, but it just kind of gives more heroes a chance to shine. And like, you know, some of the complaints we had about the female characters, are still prevalent, but it still makes it at least a little better because we get to see them more in the movies. Uh, have you seen any of the movies, by the way? No, I actually haven't. So I was just going to ask if you'd suggest watching them or not. If you're a fan of the series, I say yes, um, because it's just, it's more content to like, get to see these heroes. And um, I think the, uh, obviously it's, it's kind of a bummer when you know that like, nothing they do is going to affect them long term but it's really really fun to like see what kind of villains they come up with and I think like some things definitely do overlap in some ways and um like they just are able to comment more on some of the relationships and some of the character development so I would recommend if you're a fan of the show to definitely um check out the movies because they're just if if anything they're just a lot of fun and like they have some really fun fight scenes in them. So I would recommend for sure. I think I like the new one, um, Heroes Rising. There's uh, My Hero Academia, Two Heroes, and then there's Heroes Rising. I like Heroes Rising better than Two Heroes. Um, but that's just me personally and probably due to the fact that I like the characters that they focus on better than the other one. So, you know, I'll give you that advice at least. All right. I'll have to look into it. Also, the manga itself is just really, really, really popular, has over 26 million copies in print. Um, it, it's actually pretty low compared to like some manga, um, like One Piece is the leader and has like 462 million <laughs> copies in print. So 26 million doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a very, very popular um, manga and a popular anime. And like last year, 2019, it just like they they rank them just with how many sales uh, a manga has sold just in that one year. And it was ranked number six. So it's definitely still high on the list, still relevant. Um, and I think one of the more important things is that it's one of the most viewed anime in the West. Like uh, Crunchyroll always has it on there. Uh, lists of like most viewed anime through their service and like it definitely came at a good time I think like 2016 you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe is like in full throttle and people are obsessed with superheroes and this manga comes in and just like the perfect time um, because it's a great anime regardless but it just like picked up a lot of new viewers and I feel like it's a good one for people who don't watch a lot of anime too because it kind of gives them uh, at least somewhat of a uh, connection of like oh yeah superheroes we can relate to that even though it's done in a very different way like you said it's it, it, it is more like an anime than it is like a Marvel movie but um, it definitely for that reason I think and the timing of it became very very popular in the west and still is it's definitely one of the ones you see the most um, in uh, our anime culture. Yeah, it is definitely inaccessible. Like, I complain about season one a lot, I guess. But there's also a recap episode if you just want to watch that and then get right into season two, which I would suggest. Also, we've probably spoiled most of it if you're at this point in the podcast and haven't watched it. So I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> We might have spoiled, spoiled it, but you know what? You're still going to enjoy it and you're still going to have a good time. And um, I still recommend it, even though, even if you know what's going to happen, like it's, it's not the same as like experiencing it for yourself. So check it out. All right. Um, I also wanted to just add, like, do you, as of right now, and again, the season four has not yet completed at the time of this recording, by the time this 
uh, episode comes out, I'm sure it will have finished. Um, but do you have any theories or at least hopes for anything in the future of the story or what, where it's headed? Oh boy. Every single arc is so unique and a bit uh, out of the blue though. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like the League of Villains to ramp back up into something. Mm -hmm. I think Shigaraki has like a very scary quirk. He's a very like scary person, but he hasn't like really flexed his muscles on anything yet. Yeah. Um, I love villains. So I, I would love, you know, some really top tier villains to kind of show up. Um, uh, I don't know if they're going to bring like the big three back in, but having, uh, I think they're going to kind of drop those guys off. Um, I would like some of the interactions with the other schools that we didn't even mention uh, to come back up again. There's like, there's, there's UA obviously, but then there's other schools as well that are doing a similar thing and they all kind of intermingled in one tournament arc for their provisional licenses and they're kind of side characters that show up. I, I, it's hard to predict anything. Do you have any predictions? Um, I guess I am just interested to see what happens with Hero Society now that All Might is off the table and uh, they kind of need a new symbol of peace and Deku isn't really ready to be that yet. Um, so I'm interested to see where that goes. And with just the fact that like, because of All Might's retirement, so many people are so much more fearful. And that's kind of why villains have ramped up and the League of Villains is getting so much traction. And so I agree, like I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the League of Villains is going to do with that, um, that atmosphere, I guess. And I also just like, wanted to mention too that even though it's fantastic and it's super great to see all these quirks like one of the big things that uh, you know you realize is that um not having a quirk in this society really is truly like detrimental and like Deku and and All Might himself you know didn't have quirks um weren't born with anything and so but even then like it's like they still needed a quirk to uh to you know, continue with, uh, their lives in a way, you know, and obviously it's hard to be a superhero without a quirk, but I think it would be cool. And obviously we're, the story is focused on superheroes, but I think it would be cool to like have a character who doesn't have a quirk and also like, doesn't need one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe they might do that a little bit with the million, not to spoil a whole lot, but yeah, like the million spoiler alert. Yeah. It gets his power taken away. And I would agree. I think it would be really cool to see what he can do because re-watching through the series, I realized, wow, you know what? I really loved it when Deku did not have a handle on his power because like the tournament arc is the... Uh... It's the sports festival. <laughs> yes. So the sports festival arc is a good example because uh, Deku has to be very careful with using his power. He can't just use it thoughtlessly because then he'll be out of the running so like the the first challenge is a race and he wins the race without using his power at all and I was like what, what re-watching through the series I was like wow it's so fun to watch someone think through these puzzles and like you know figure out a way to keep going without a power and um, without using his power and I just think that's just such a cool idea and I would want to see more of that kind of ingenuity instead of just, I'm going to punch something really hard, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I definitely, you know, we've all seen a main character punch something really hard before. So let's see something right. else. <laughs> yes, yes. But I'm definitely excited. And um, I think this past arc was kind of a fluffy school festival arc. And now we can get into something a little deeper, hopefully. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about My Hero Academia. There's still so much that we didn't talk about. I mean, it's four seasons of great content. There's a lot there. So again, we just recommend you check it out. Um, watch it. Let us know what you think. Um, uh, we're at Fanimated Podcasts on all the social medias. Um, but for now, besides My Hero Academia, 
Uh, what have you been watching, Nathan? Well, Kelly, um, maybe we should start with you this time because we might talk about the anime I've been watching for a long time. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I wanted to take this moment to um, shout out to Mob Psycho 100 because I actually watched it quite a while ago, but I binged watched it so quickly that I didn't, I didn't like talk about it on any of the episodes because it, it was just like a blip in my uh, watching radar. But I binged it so quickly because it's so phenomenal. And I want to talk about it because it is also from Studio Bones. So you can imagine what the animation is like. And honestly, I'm sure a lot of people who watch a lot of anime have already watched it. I don't know why it took me so long, but here we are. Um, Mob Psycho 100 is about a middle schooler who has psychic powers and um, he works with a fake psychic to solve uh, mysteries of the supernatural. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's another phenomenal <laughs> anime, but it is very unusual. The art style is crazy different, and but the animation is phenomenal. It's kind of like Mob Psycho 100 is like, it, it, it's a comedy too. Like it feels like the reason I didn't give it a, a watch to begin with was that it feels a little like, uh, I'm trying to even think if there's anything I can compare it to, but it's like, I, I was just assuming it was Is it like psych? D did you ever watch psych? I never watched psych. No. It's essentially like it's live, uh, sitcom, but it's the son of a detective pretends that he has psychic powers but really he's just like a good detective oh. to solve people's like issues That's hilarious. and so like he's technically like solving you know the crime or the murder like on the side using oh. just like regular detective skills but he pretends to be a psychic wow. to everyone else <laughs> that's hilarious and i love it um it, it probably has that similar type of vibe like it's but it, it's a comedy you know but it still is like has these serious moments it has this overarching plot um, and Mob, the main character, he, his powers, basically the whole point and why it's called My Mob Psycho 100 is that his powers are triggered by his emotions. And so what he does to like, because he has this insane power, like he's so OP, but it works because he wants to still be a normal kid. Um, and so he wants to like engage socially and like be a normal person. So he suppresses all of his emotions so that he isn't being weird, <laughs> basically. But what happens is because he's suppressing his emo emotions, you just see as the, the episode progresses, like um, a percentage bar will keep rising every time he's suppressing his emotions in any way. And then once it reaches 100%, he goes berserk. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay. It's like he's storing up all his psychic energy and then it is released when all and whenever his emotions are like fully triggered. And so it's it's just done in a really, really ingenious way and is just so fun and like the relationships are fantastic. And again, the animation is so different and the art style itself is just so different and so 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 fluid and so good and like wow. Uh, it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't seen it but just trust me it's good if you like shonen battle anime especially more comedy centric this is great for you all right i'll have to check it out absolutely for two seasons all right kelly all right Are you ready yeah so um i listened to this this podcast that recently released some top 10 of the decade lists <laughs> and the number one anime of the decade <laughs> from that podcast Which is was an anime series called Demon Slayer <laughs> and I'd never even um, uh, heard of it uh, so <laughs> if it's the number one of the decade you know I had to watch it oh good <laughs> good that makes me so happy <laughs> oh my goodness um, so I essentially binge watched the entire first season 
Hey guys, Kelly from the future here. I was just editing this episode and realized that um, Nathan and I talked about Demon Slayer for like 20 minutes. So I'm actually gonna save that conversation and make an episode on it in the future. Kind of a mini Demon Slayer episode for season one. Um, it'll be very light spoilers. So Definitely keep an eye out for that, but in the meantime, let's just go back and wrap up this My Hero Academia episode. Thanks, guys. All right. Anything else last minute do you think of before we head? Nope. Uh, we just talked for an hour and 50 minutes, though, so good luck editing. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, guys, I don't think... Uh, we'll behind the curtain here for our listeners. I usually, yeah, record two to three hours of content with people. And then, <laughs> then I meticulously like sift through all of it and edit it down as much as I can. Um, it's a lot of fun though. I enjoy it, but that's why it takes so long for episodes to come out. Um, I, you know, I can't do it every week. It's, it's a lot, but I love doing it. And so thank, and thanks for listening, everyone who's out there. Um, you know, actually, now that I think about it, because I was just thinking about Tanjiro and his father and all of that. Now I'm thinking, I forgot to mention, with My Hero Academia, I want to know where Deku's father is. Because they never... Oh, because you're obsessed with boys with their, <laughs> with their fathers. <laughs> I'm obsessed with nerds and their daddy issues, a.k.a. Uh, hiccups, <laughs> a.k.a. Totoro, a.k.a. Deku, where's your dad? <laughs> um and i i looked online and i i know i shouldn't have done this because i don't like spoilers but i just wanted to know is there anything out there and there isn't there's nothing there's nothing in the manga about his dad either they never mention him they don't even say oh he's dead or oh he's away or like we don't know the only thing that's mentioned is that he can breathe fire that's that's his father's quirk but we don't know who he is or what he's doing. Oh, wow. Okay. So I wanted to oh. mention that too. But yes, I am a little bit obsessed with father-son relationships. I think they're awesome and they just, good stories right there. Good storytelling. But hey, you know, there would be better, there would be great like, uh, you know, mother or son or mother-daughter relationships if they wouldn't kill off all the moms all the time. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not up. laughing at the dead moms but like oh yeah yeah but yeah that's so rough Ugh. i blame full metal alchemist yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> oh how dare they <sighs> yeah that's another good father-son relationship too man <clears throat> anyways <laughs> <laughs> just full of them all right well, with that, um, we'll call it a day since it's been two hours of recording. Uh, this was awesome. I can't wait for uh, more My Hero Academia to come out. And we'll definitely be talking about it in the future because there's still a lot of story to go. So I'm excited to see what happens. Sounds great. Thanks for having me on, Kelly. Thank Glad you I for could, you know. Well, here virtually. Talk about all this. For, yeah, talk about all this and, you know open your eyes to the fact that Harry Potter is an action anime. <laughs> I love it. I can't wait to see your um, dissertation on this. Uh, <laughs> write a nice uh, essay about <laughs> how Harry Potter is an, an anime. <laughs> Alright guys, we will talk to you later. Bye! <laughs>much for listening let us know who your favorite superhero is on facebook and instagram at fanimated podcast you can also email us at fanimated at gmail.com you can support the podcast and get behind the scenes content at patreon.com slash fanimated the art for this podcast is done by me you can find me on instagram at candor draw the music is provided by purple planet music and a huge thank you to nathan for joining me today 
We hope everyone is safe and healthy. And until next time, stay tuned and stay animated. Hello, Fanimators. This is your captain speaking with the forecast of My Hero Academia. Rough waters ahead as we witness some strong ships in the midst of rocky waves. First and foremost, we have the adorable pair of Deku and Ochaku. These two are amazing because despite being frickin' teenagers, these two are always watching out for each other and keeping their focus on the important goals, such as becoming better heroes for the world and making a difference in people's lives even if it's a simple smile. But when the studies and jobs are not the focus of the anime, we get to glimpse moments of how the two like each other, which makes this captain want to jump overboard. For example, there's been moments when Ochaku has inner monologued about, what is this feeling I feel when I'm around Deku? Um, love, duh. Or how about how nervous Deku gets when Ochaku is super close to him? Furthermore, the two love teaming up together and supporting one another through everything. As we continue to dive into this anime, the ship grows stronger and the viewers get to witness these adorable moments along the way. Besides this ship, not many other ships have surfaced yet. However, I will note that I would totally ship Red Riot and Pinky. They share a connection with Red Riot's past which draws them closer together. But then again, Pinky and Kaminari do seem to team up quite often. This has been your Captain Emma, over and out.